So how many of you had a shot of adrenaline run through your body when Tim said in two weekends it will be our first? <laughs> and you know, don't get me wrong, most of us love to celebrate Christmas. Most of us. I get, I get that sometimes, you know, the holidays can be hard. And sometimes holidays are great one year and then because of what has happened over the past year, it's really hard. But most of us love this idea that God loved the whole wide world so much that God came to this earth as a baby, as Jesus. And this seems like such a simple concept to us, doesn't it? It's, it's something so simple, we think, that even children can understand. But in the midst of all of this celebration of this baby born. We often forget an incredibly important truth, and it's a truth we want to focus on in this series, and here it is. Though a baby born in a manger certainly seems like something, like someone that we can comprehend, the truth is that God is incomprehensible to the human mind. As the great philosopher Thomas Aquinas said, if you comprehend God, he is not God. If you can comprehend God, he is not God. Now, I don't really understand that. It's why I got a C minus in college philosophy, okay? I don't, I don't get Thomas Aquinas at all. But I think my best understanding of that is that the God who created us, the God who loves us, who decided to become one of us in order to make a way for us to know him, this God is actually beyond our knowing. And God appears in our lives and in the lives of those recorded in this book as both complete stranger and eternal friend. And if we're honest, if we're really honest, when we read the Bible, tell me this isn't true. God acts in ways we do not get at all. God is both friend and complete stranger. And Dave, if you were here last weekend, Dave talked about this. And you know, the more I think about it, the more I realize this is true in our own lives. We often profess that we completely understand God. When in fact, God confuses us, God maddens us, God frustrates us. And to be frank, sometimes God disappoints us, doesn't he? All the while, God is our deepest hope. What a predicament we humans are in. And we're not alone, even in the story that so many of us are familiar with, the story leading up to the birth of Jesus, we find real human beings having run-ins with God that are completely confusing to them, where God is both friend and complete stranger. And Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, the man who first proclaimed Jesus the Savior of the world, Zechariah had an incredibly confusing and unexpected encounter with one of God's representatives that will be our focus this morning. So we're going to just work our way through this story. It's found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, and we're going to see what we can learn about this God we can't comprehend. So this is what Luke writes. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So right away, Luke wants us to know this is not a fairy tale he's writing. He didn't start by saying once upon a time in a land far, far away. He grounds it in history. This is a true historic event. And it's taking place in a very painful time in the history of the Jewish people. They were living under King Herod and they were living in oppression, under occupation, and they were in despair waiting for a savior. God's faithful people had been in a period of about 450 years where God was silent. 
a faithful people waiting in darkness, hoping beyond hope that God saw them and that God would speak to them again and would rescue them from their captivity. And I wonder if you ever feel like this in your life. Do you ever wonder why God who promises to be your friend goes AWOL for long periods of time? Why the God who is the great communicator goes silent on you when you most need him? Why God allows bad things to happen to good and faithful people and he seems to do nothing to stop it? If you're there this morning, you are not alone. You are not alone. Now at this time, when we're, when we're uh, reading in Luke this story, Jewish life was centered in the temple in Jerusalem. And it was staffed by religious professionals known as priests. And you became a priest by being born into the priestly line. So we read in the beginning of this story that Zechariah is a priest and his wife Elizabeth also comes from a family of priests that dates all the way back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. So these are good, solid, God-fearing people. We would say, if we were talking about them today, they come from good families. These are good people, okay? So this is the setup. We continue. Both of them, this is Zechariah and Elizabeth, were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. Okay, I'm gonna stop right here and just say, they always blame it on the woman, okay? <laughs> now we understand it can be both sides of the story here, so I just wanna back that up for a minute and say, it's not Elizabeth's fault only. But they were, sorry, they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So Elizabeth and Zechariah had been doing all the right things in life, and yet their circumstances weren't playing out the way they had hoped. You know, and again, I, I, I just want to ask, as we read through this ancient story, does this place in life feel familiar to you at all? Do you come to church this morning feeling like you've done your life, the way you thought God wanted you to live your life, and yet you find yourself in circumstances that weren't at all what you were expecting. This is when God can often feel more like a stranger than a friend, isn't it? When things don't go the way we had hoped. So Luke continues. Once, he writes, when Zechariah's division was on duty, this is his division of priests, and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, when I look at this section, it, it seems as if Luke is trying to use words to get us to understand that things were kind of just falling into place. He says, look at how these things all fell in line. Once, Zechariah's division just happened to be on duty, and Zechariah was chosen by lot. It was almost like, you know, picking spoons or picking the short end of the stick or whatever. There were 18,000 priests available to serve at any given time, and this one time, it just happened to be Zechariah's turn. Luke is letting us know in un, no uncertain terms, God is orchestrating what is happening in this story. Now, do not hear me say, as I say that, that God will then surely orchestrate finding you the perfect parking place next time you want to eat in downtown Cedar Falls, because that surely will not happen, okay? I am definitely not saying that, but Luke is definitely wanting us to know that God was in charge of what was happening in this story. Luke continues. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Okay, so you gotta picture this scene. 
This is, this is Zechariah's one chance in his lifetime to go into the temple and burn incense. And there were all these people, people like us, worshipers, faithful people, waiting outside the temple. And what they were doing was offering up their prayers. And they were praying that God would hear the intercession, the prayers of the priest who was going into the temple to pray for them. So they were asking God to hear Zechariah's prayers, but they were also outside to make sure that if the priest died while he was in there because he was overwhelmed by the presence of God, they would be there to pull him out. Okay, so how'd you like that job? You know, I'm just hoping beyond hope that he comes out so I don't have to go in there and get him. And again, we think of God as friend, but he is also incomprehensible and other. So what happens next? This is what Luke writes. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. So this is Zechariah. An angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Okay, this is why I love this story so much. Zechariah is just like me. He's just like you. See, he was expecting to go into the temple and be all alone in there. No one went into the holy place with the priest. And I mean, you know, I'm sure he was hoping for some kind of encounter with God. But I think like most of us, he wasn't really expecting it was going to happen. So I picture him, you know, just going about his business getting ready to light the candle of incense. Kind of us, you know, when we're home alone in a room, we think we're alone, we're just going about our business, and then someone appears all of a sudden to us, like we didn't know they were home, and they just show up, and we just pass out with fear. That's what happened. My big brother used to do this to me all the time when I was little. And what was the result? I was startled and gripped with fear, just like Zechariah, and on the rare occasion, I would even wet my pants, which just (laughs) brought my brother... So much joy, (laughs) just like an overabundance of joy, right? So Zechariah has this encounter with this angel of God and is completely freaked out. And then the angel says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. If you were here last week and heard Dave talk, you know, when the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, The angel said to them, do not be afraid. And let let me just say, this phrase, do not be afraid, is offered almost every time an angel of God appears to human beings. It is, I believe, the message of Advent. It's said to Zechariah, it's said to Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the, in the Advent story in Matthew, it's said to Joseph, it's said to the shepherds, it's spoken over and over and over again to fearful, frail creatures like us in the scriptures. And I believe it's said to you this morning, if you find yourself like Zechariah, startled by life and gripped by fear, and very confused about what God is up to. I mean, maybe it's a money issue or a job issue or something related to your future or a relationship or a health issue, or maybe it's just generalized anxiety about the state of the world we live in. Can I get a witness to this? And you know, the way it is said, the way do not be afraid is said to Zechariah here. The way the words are written in the original language, it is as if the angel is saying, do not be afraid because God is up to something in your life. Even when you have given up hope, even when you feel like nothing is happening, the angel was saying to Zechariah, even when your people have been in darkness for 450 years, God is at work in this world and God is at work in your life. And I believe God says the same thing to each one of us this morning. Do not fear For I am up to something in your life. 
even when it feels I'm far away and silent, even when I feel like more of a stranger than a friend, I see you, I hear your cries for help, I love you, and I am for you, and I will answer you. But it's probably going to be in a very unexpected way. And the angel says to Zechariah, after he says, do not be afraid, he said, your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. And the word used by the angel to describe Zechariah's prayer implies that it was a lifelong prayer. Your prayer has been heard, Zechariah, and God has been hearing your prayer all along. Zechariah had been praying and praying and praying and waiting praying that God would give he and his wife a child, praying that God would rescue and redeem his people through the coming of a Messiah. And all along, it seemed as if God had not heard him. And yet, he had. And sometimes, God's prayers, God's answers to prayers come in surprising ways after a really long time. And the angel says, Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you. Don't you just love that? I mean, this to me is another beautiful sign of God's gentle and personal grace and care for human individuals. Because even in the midst of this world-changing story that Luke is telling, God's representative says to this old man, not only am I going to give you a son, not only will your son be at work in the fulfillment of my grand rescue plan, but for you, old mom, old dad, this boy you're going to have is going to be a joy and a delight. Now, the angel didn't say, but he's going to grow up to be a real weirdo, okay? (laughs) He's going to wear like fur and live in the desert and eat wild bugs. But, you know, you can only give people as much as they can handle. So right now, he will be a joy and a delight. And the angel continues, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, no kombucha for this kid, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Now these are signs. These are words that are rich with history. This is a sign. This baby will be set apart for the work of God. And then the angel says these next words, these words this priest, Zechariah, would have immediately recognized from a story about the Old Testament prophet Elijah. This is what the angel says. He, your son, John the Baptist, will bring many, back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth baby boy that the angel is telling him about is linked with the prophet Elijah because one of the most important things prophets did was turn the hearts of people back to God. And so the angel is letting Zechariah know right here in this moment that his child will be the start of the beginning of the once and for all redemptive restoration work of God in this world. Can you, can you imagine Zechariah's mind trying to catch up with all that's happening here? He's being given an earful by this startling angel. So I do not blame Zechariah for this next question. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, mm, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. First of all, even with the angel, Zechariah's being a good husband. You know what I'm saying? He's like kind of protecting Elizabeth's, you know, reputation. Like I'm old and my wife is well along in years. So how's that gonna work? 
I mean, how are we going to have a baby? Innocent question, right? And we could spend time just taking Zechariah down for his disbelief, or we can find comfort in it. He's just like us. I mean, do you blame him for asking this question? But the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So he has this mind-blowing, life-changing experience with the angel, this news about the rescue mission of God coming true through this son that he and his old wife are going to have, and he can't tell anyone about it? He can't go home and tell Elizabeth anything? Why? Why does God do this kind of thing? Why does he make a faithful, good man unable to speak just because he asked a legitimate question. Why? God is incomprehensible to us. Meanwhile, right? So all of this is happening in the temple. Temple. Meanwhile, the people are still out there waiting. Now they're starting to wonder, does one of us have to go in to get him? Did he die? You go get him. I'm not going to get him. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Now, the priest, you see, was supposed to go in, light the incense, pray the prayers for the people, and then come out of the temple and offer a benediction over all the faithful people who had waited for him. But he couldn't. He came out and he couldn't pray over them. But somehow, he let them know he had seen a vision or something, and I giggled at this because I just pictured the world's earliest form of charades. I mean, can you picture him trying to act out what had happened and a baby? And I mean, so... I just don't even know what was going on there. But anyway, he came out, he couldn't speak, and then it says when his time of service was completed, he returned home. Now, let's picture this scene, shall we? Elizabeth's just minding her own business. She's an old lady. She sent her husband off to do his priestly duty. And Zechariah comes back and he can't tell Elizabeth what just happened or what is about to happen because he cannot speak. So... Can you imagine Elizabeth, though, asking these questions to herself after her man comes home, and she's like, what happened in Jerusalem? Why is this old man of mine so frisky all of a sudden? <laughs> this is the most understated sentence in all the Bible. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. That's all we know. <laughs> after this... His wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. She was probably just trying to get away from him. She's like, I must remain in seclusion, Zechariah. Um, and then it says, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And you can read the rest of the story in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Elizabeth waited on God, and in a way she never could have imagined, even after she had given up hope, God came through for her in a miraculous way. And God came through for Zechariah. He came through for the whole wide world through their miracle baby. For John the baptizer would pave the way for a different kind of miracle baby, Jesus, the Savior of the world, through one of the strangest ideas ever heard, that God, the God who created the universe, would himself choose to die on a cross to save the sinful world from their sins. I'm telling you, no human being would make that idea up. 
God is incomprehensible to us. God is both friend and stranger. God does things that we don't understand, even in the Christmas story, a story I think most of us think we get. And yet, even this story leaves us with so many questions, doesn't it? Questions I asked throughout this whole teaching, but if you notice, I never answered any of them. I asked, do you ever wonder why God who promises to be our friend goes AWOL for long periods of time? Why the God who promises to communicate goes silent? Why God's people had to endure 450 years of silence? Why do we have to endure God's silence? Why on earth does God allow bad things to happen to really great people and it seems he does nothing to stop it? And then I asked, do you come to church this morning feeling like you've been abandoned by God in some way, like you've done all the right things with your life and yet your circumstances didn't turn out in the way that you had hoped? Why? Why does God allow that? And after Zechariah was struck dumb, I asked, why? Why does God do this kind of thing? Why does he make a faithful good guy unable to speak just because he dared ask a legitimate question? And all throughout this story and throughout our stories, there are waiting people. And I asked, why? Why does God make us wait? Some of us here are waiting on God this morning for really big things. And you don't know how much I wish I could tell you why or when your waiting will end or how your waiting will end. But you know what? I can't. I can't answer. Not even for Christmas. Because God is incomprehensible to us. God is mystery. God is so far beyond our human minds And there's just so much we cannot know, so much we cannot understand, so much we cannot comprehend. And we want to be honest about that. But let me leave you with this one thing that we can know. Whether we showed up here this morning confused or sad or grieving or joyful or waiting or disappointed or wondering where in the heck God is right now why we can't see him or feel him or understand him. Despite all we cannot know, this we can know. And I believe we can know it deep in our bones because of the story of Christmas. And that is this. God is good. God is good. God is good. It was the great Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who said this. He said, God is too good to be unkind, and he's too wise to be mistaken. So when we cannot trace his hand, when he feels like a stranger to us, we must trust his heart. And his heart toward you. Let's pray. God, would you forgive us for simplifying you down to a little G kind of God that we think we can comprehend? Would you forgive us for trying to remake you in our image? Would you forgive us for thinking we have you all figured out? Would you forgive us for thinking we can just put you in a box and like list five or six facts and then think that's all we need to know? Would you remind us afresh during the season of darkness and light that you are mystery to us, that you are bigger than our human minds can comprehend? But would you also remind us afresh that you so love the world that you gave your only son, that you came to this earth yourself in the flesh 
so that we could see you and touch you and know you and trust you and see that your heart is good. Help each one of us take a step forward in trusting your heart this morning. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus, whom we continue to worship in song this morning. Amen. Thank you.